isn't any use trying to resist me. You are coming with me whether you like it or not. Teal felt the magnetic handcuffs seal around her wrists as the law defender grasped her firmly from behind the back of her head and yanked her by her hair towards the patrol shuttle. He seemed pleased with himself for finding her on the streets after curfew. I am looking for my little brother. I don't care if we are looking for a new moon, but I'd be more aching to thinking you were looking for a taker, Nightwalker. Pretty young thing like you out here all alone. You know darn well females are not allowed out after dusk. Nightwalkers are the only fools silly enough to break the law. I am going to take you back to the station and book you for soliciting. Teal sat quietly in the back of the shuttle as they flew off. She seemed openly defiant, but inside she was shitting herself. She had not seen or heard of a single person who had returned home after heading to the Defender Station. She would just have to explain her situation to the evaluator because the law defender didn't seem to believe her story. At fifteen, Teal had tried to keep her nose clean. If it hadn't been for her younger brother Bracken's obsession with finding fresh water, she would have been safely inside their pod, playing her favorite vintage game of Halo, which had been handed down from her great-grandfather. She had a great fondness for history and had been studying it for as long as she could read. Teal felt partly to blame that her kid brother wanted to find a fresh water spring after she had told him about them from reading history books. The thought that 70% of the world was once covered in water intrigued the pair. They only ever knew of the synthetic product, which came through the pipes and into their pod once per day. It was such an expensive commodity that they could only afford a little at a time. Some days they would go without altogether. Teal couldn't believe that people used to wash in water. All they had ever used was washing gel. They would cover themselves with it, and then the dryer cube would blast warm air to remove it, along with any dirt from their body. To have water run over yourself to clean with was an unthinkable indulgence. Teal's thoughts were suddenly brought back to reality as the shuttle pulled up outside of the station. The law defender turned around and smiled at her coldly, before hitting the button to release the lid above their heads. <laughs> the evaluator will be darn pleased with my capture tonight. I might even get a bonus water fill because of you, little lady. The law defender said this with a wry grin on his face as he grabbed Teal by her handcuffs and pulled her roughly from the shuttle. What is going to happen to me? <laughs> what happens to every other female caught breaking the law? You will find out soon enough. Now get moving! The defender was holding on to her so firmly that there was no way of escape. Teal had no option but to do as she was told. Once they had entered the building, Teal stood in a line with a number of other prisoners who had been rounded up that evening. They were shuffled forward, one after the other, towards a large black desk at the end of the foyer. An android stood there, scanning their microchips, before each prisoner in turn was stood before the evaluator. He spoke so quietly that Teal couldn't hear what he was saying to the prisoners until she was next in line to be placed before him. Jade, 7386, age 31. You are sentenced to four years' labor for nightwalking solicitation via transportation on spacecraft afterlife. Next. The woman was led away without as much as a pardon or a plea of her innocence. Teal, 3463, aged 15. The evaluator stopped speaking and looked up from his info cell as he eyed Teal with interest. He then turned his attention to the law defender who was standing next to their prisoner. Is this your capture? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good find, defender. Droid. Take this man's information and pump 15 liters of our finest water to his pod. 
The law defender smiled broadly down at Thiel. He was indeed right to say that the evaluator would be pleased with his capture of her. Thiel, 3463, aged 15. You are sentenced to 10 years labor for nightwalking solicitation as a minor via transportation on spacecraft reborn. Next. You can't do this. It's all lies. I'm innocent. Teal turned and made a dash for the entrance door. However, she didn't get very far before feeling strong hands grabbing at her and a stun needle being plunged deeply into her shoulder. Then everything went dark. Teal had no idea where she was when she woke up. Everything was black around her, and as she lay strapped firmly to her position, all she could hear was buzzing and clicking sounds. She felt an immense pain in her head, and she wondered if she had been struck down. Nothing seemed right, nor familiar to her. Then she could make out the sound of footsteps and a lever being pulled. Suddenly, there was a bright light above her head, and she could make out the silhouette of a person standing over her. Once her eyes had adjusted to the light, she realized that she was lying in a hibernation capsule. She had only seen them as images on a screen, but now she knew that she had been placed in one. Stay still while I scan you. Teal tried hard to focus on the man. His voice did not sound threatening, and as her pupils began to adjust to the light, Teal saw a man in his mid-twenties with dark brown hair and blue eyes. He smiled at her kindly as he ran a laser beam up and down her body. You have traveled well. My name is Dr. Greenwich. I will get you some medication for your headache. I'm sure your head is thumping as much as mine was when I came out of hibernation. Where am I? You are on the spaceship, Reborn. We are about to land at a planet called Judas. We are to build a city and recolonize here. But why am I here? Because you were sentenced as a night walker and are fertile. Just the same as every other female who have been chosen to colonize this planet. That is a lie. I have never been, nor shall I be, a night walker. Well, I know nothing of your life before you entered the spaceship. My job is to maintain the health and well-being of those chosen to colonize Judison. However, I suggest you make the best of your new life as there will not be another ship to take you home for at least ten years. Then, of course, you will have your offspring to consider before you think of leaving. I am not planning to have any offspring while I am a prisoner here. Well, sadly, you have no choice in that matter. If you don't mate with a taker when you are at, a, at the fertile stage of your first cycle, you will be an open target for any of the takers who have yet to be paired up with a female. There are not quite enough females to go around. Your partner will be your only protection to stop this from happening. After he said this, he drew very close to her face and began to whisper quietly in her ear. Don't look at it, but our conversation is being monitored from behind a mirror cam on the wall. I will pretend I am checking your teeth while I relay to you information that I am not at a liberty to share with the prisoners. But you must promise me you will keep it our secret. Now blink twice if you trust me and understand what I'm saying. Teal looked closely into the doctor's eyes and she saw an honesty about him. She had also heard horror stories about takers. It appeared they preyed on females without any concern and even though their practice was illegal on earth, it was rife. She had no option but to trust this man, so she quickly blinked twice. Open your mouth wide. Neon stated this loudly so he would be heard over the mirror cam. Once he had his head close to Teal's face once more, he carried on whispering. I believe you when you say that you are not a night walker. You are very young and I worry about your well-being. The only reason you have been captured is because of your age and the amount of offspring you are capable of producing in ten years. You must find a kind partner quickly, because some of the takers upon this ship are brutal and may treat you badly. I have been told they have all been handpicked because of their lusting, whether the female they take be a night walker or not. Please blink twice if you understand what I'm trying to tell you, and what you must decide quickly. 
Teal did as he asked while he carried on, looking inside her open mouth. She was starting to feel very afraid now. She wished she could shut her eyes again and wake up at her pod, with her brother safely asleep in his divider. This nightmare was beyond anything she could determine that the world controllers could ever imagine. Why were they so determined to set up a new colony so far from home? Was Earth finally dying? When her parents were alive, she had remembered hearing them talking about such an occurrence happening one day. Even the materials used for making their synthetic water were slowly diminishing. Perhaps they had sent the spacecraft to set up a new world before Earth was completely destroyed. But why had they sent the Nightwalkers and Takers? It didn't make any sense. Very good. You can close your mouth now. You have a tooth that needs recapping, but other than that, your teeth and gums are in excellent health. I will now release you from the hibernation capsule and treat your headache. Then you are free to stroll around the female confines of the ship. He took a metallic needle kit from the trolley next to the capsule, and placing the needle upon her temple, he pushed the stopper and the pain in her head quickly diminished. Once she was free to leave the cubicle, Teal didn't know what she should do next, or where she should go. She just followed a few of the other women as they made their way down the corridor and into a large, open lounge. She was expecting to find cold, hard-nosed nightwalkers amongst the group of females gathered there. But instead, they all looked as dazed and scared as she was. No one spoke, and they all looked up at the hologram broadcast by the world controllers, which screened on one of the walls of the lounge. You individuals are the chosen ones to populate and grow the new colony of Judison. The Earth has only so many years left before all resources are depleted. It is your mission to keep the human race alive and build a city on this planet. Therefore, you have an extremely important task ahead of you. We have ensured that the takers we have chosen to join you will assist you in achieving this goal. They have the ability to take charge of you, and also they have the skills to build a future haven for the rest of us to join in ten years' time. Before you left Earth on this mission, we had your microchips reprogrammed. Should you choose to resist our orders and not take a partner or become barren, you are of no use to us and you will be terminated immediately. We wish you all well for a productive future on Judison. Hail the World Controllers and the Judison Project. The hologram kept on playing the same message over and over again. There was no way of switching it off, and after a short time, Teal could not stand to listen to it a moment longer. She ran from the room as tears started to appear at the corner of her eyes. She didn't want the other women to see her in a weak state, as she fought with herself internally to stay emotionally strong. It seemed to be the only way she would be able to cope with what lay ahead of her. Teal walked back towards the room she had come from, when suddenly a message could be heard across the entire ship which came out of nowhere. All passengers on board Reborn, this is your captain speaking. Every member upon the ship has now come out of hibernation. We will be landing on Judison in five minutes. The ship's doctor has screened all of you and informed you of what is required of you. Therefore, once you leave this ship, all Nightwalkers are to choose a partner from the takers you have been provided with. You have one day to achieve this task, so choose wisely as this partner is to be your soulmate for the rest of your future on Judison. If you do not take a partner within this time frame, you are of no use to the project and will be terminated. We have a contingent of droids to take control of law enforcement on the planet. However, it is up to each individual to remain calm and focused on the tasks you have ahead. I wish you all well as we build the city. Once all the cargo is unloaded from the ship, and we have taken on fresh supplies, the ship and its crew will be returning to Earth. That is, apart from Dr. Greenwich, who will remain on the planet as your advisor and medical officer. 
good life to you all, and good luck. Teal's heart suddenly started to pound in her chest. They certainly were not wasting any time in ensuring that reproduction of the new colony would start as soon as they arrived on the planet. She felt physically sick, and she quickly darted towards the sewage cubicle that she had spied on the way to the lounge. Having been in hibernation for so long, she did not manage to throw up anything other than bile. That only seemed to go a little way in settling the deep ache that had formed in the pit of her stomach. She felt a slight bump as the spaceship touched down on the surface of the planet. Then there was a sound of marching feet outside of the sewage cubicle. The door flew open and a droid stood there with a laser weapon pointed at her body. I'm coming. Teal hastily stepped back into the corridor. It seemed the droids were programmed to ensure that no one was left behind, because they searched every room along the female corridor while marching the women towards an exit door. She hadn't really thought what the planet of Judison would be like. Teal was more concerned with what was expected of her over the coming days than to give any attention to the place they were to live. Yet, the moment she walked through the exit door, her heart rose through her chest and almost exploded with sheer joy. The lush green valley where the ship had landed was beyond anything she could have imagined that Earth had once been like. She had only ever known the dirty, run-down city and the barren wastelands beyond it. Until now, the only vegetation she had ever seen in her lifetime was at a farm dome her parents had taken her to once when she was young. But this was incredible. Then she spied in the distance something even more amazing and totally overwhelming. There was an ocean of water as far as the eye could see. If she could have run off barefoot through the grass, Teal would have done so in a heartbeat, but sadly reality soon hit home when the droids started to offload the cargo of takers. There was not a young man among them, nor any that Teal would have considered a suitable partner in normal circumstances. The fact that as soon as they saw the women standing there, the look of lust upon some of their faces frightened her even more. How could she choose one to take as a partner? without even having a chance to get to know them. Then, as the group of women were told they were free to start choosing their mate, all hell broke loose. It seemed that some of the takers thought that it was their right to do the same, and Teal seemed to be the target of their attention. Three burly men hastily advanced towards her, which soon turned into a nasty fight. One of them grabbed Teal around her neck as the other two men tried to pull her away from him. She could feel the life being choked out of her as the grip of the man's fingers tightened about her windpipe. Then, with little air left to breathe, she soon lost consciousness. When Teal woke up, there was a man standing over her, but she wasn't outside anymore. She was back on the spaceship. She tried to sit up, but a hand came down on her shoulder to prevent her from doing so. Stay lying there for a minute until you come around a little more. What happened? Where have the takers gone? The droids terminated two of them. And other men backed away and one of the night walkers paired up with him. However, that has left a huge problem for you. I don't understand. Teal placed her hand upon her sore neck and rubbed it gently. We do not have any takers left. There is no one to pair with you. Unexpectedly, several fights broke out, and a number of other takers were also terminated by the droids. You are the only female left without a partner, and I do not have the authority to change the ruling set down by the world controllers. When the day is over, you will be terminated, because they have no use for you now. Teal felt the cold realization of this fact grip her with fear. She had done nothing wrong, and yet she was to be punished in the most brutal way imaginable. What about the other ship? It will have takers on it, too. The evaluator told the prisoner before me she would be on the ship after life. Can't I wait until that ship arrives on Judison and pick a taker from them? There is no other ship by the name of Afterlife Teal. The prisoner before you would have been over thirty years old and she would have been taken anyway and terminated. 
I'm not ready to die. What if I chose you as my partner? You're staying on the planet with us, aren't you? Dr. Greenwich looked down at her with surprise upon his face. I don't know if they will allow me to take a partner. I'm not a taker. I've been authorized to live on Judison only as an advisor and medical officer. I guess there's no harm in asking the captain. I'll return soon. Teal watched him as he left the room. Surely the captain would agree to her suggestion. After all, the evaluator was pleased she had been caught. With all that had happened up until now, he wouldn't be happy if the youngest member of the Nightwalkers had been left without a taker to breed with. And, if she had to take a partner, Teal thought that Dr. Greenwich was at least tolerable and closer to her own age. The wait for the reply to her question seemed to take forever. Teal had no idea how long she had been unconscious, nor how much of that day was left before her life would come to an abrupt end. She wondered what death would be like, and shook her head angrily, trying to relieve it of such negative thoughts. She still had a chance to live, even if it was a slim one. Then, when she thought that he'd never return, Dr. Greenwich came back into the room. Teal held her breath, wanting to know his reply, and yet dreading it at the same time. The captain contacted the world controllers, and they have decided that due to a technicality, I am eligible to take her to be chosen by you. You see, I just so happened to be out after curfew tending to an injured nightwalker. At first, the law defender thought I was a taker, but once I had explained the situation to the evaluator, he gave me an ultimatum. I either join this mission as a medical officer and advisor, or lose my license to practice medicine. So there you have it. We are to be partnered after all. I will take care of you, Teal. And you can call me by my first name. Neon. He smiled at her kindly, and she sighed heavily. She was grateful that her life had been spared, but also apprehensive of this new and awkward relationship she was about to share with a complete stranger. We need to leave the ship now. They are making ready to depart. There is a droid outside of the front door to escort us onto the planet. Are you feeling strong enough to walk, or would you prefer that I carry you? I'm quite able to walk, thank you. Teal got slowly to her feet, and with the aid of Neon supporting her, they made their way to the exit door. Once the pair had left the ship, the engines were soon boosted and Reborn took off slow at first, and then disappeared into warp speed with a flash of light. Everything seemed to have calmed down on the planet. With the droids watching over the two hundred odd prisoners, they resigned themselves to the fact that they had to make the best of what was now their new home. After witnessing the termination of the troublemakers, no one was willing to cause another scene. Neon went and stood on one of the smaller containers, so that the group could all see him while he informed them what they were to do next. Right, everyone. I need your attention, please. We need to make a temporary base camp. All the supplies that have been left for us are listed on the containers. I expect everyone to help in the task of setting up our camp. As you have already witnessed today, any disruption to the job at hand will have a deadly consequence. The droids have been placed here to deal with the policing of this planet. I have no control over their programming. Please note, you have now been duly warned. At dinner this evening, I will tell you as much as I know about Judas and from the information that has been gathered by space probes. They were initially sent here to test the feasibility of the planet maintaining human life. There are enough shelters for each couple to have their own pod, and we also need to erect larger shelters for communal use in the men and women's latrines. Now shall we get started before the sun sets and we lose much of this valuable natural light? Teal was quite impressed by the way in which Neon took charge. Even though he was one of the younger males within the colony, the prisoners all seemed happy to take orders from him. Everyone started to unpack the containers and erect their temporary accommodation without complaining or causing any more issues. Once the camp was established, they all joined together in the cafeteria to partake in the evening meal. When they had finished eating, 
Neon stood up to address the group again. Thank you everyone for cooperating and setting up our base camp so quickly. Tomorrow, I will choose several of you with planning skills to join me on the Skybikes. We will scout the region for a suitable site to start building our new city. As you would have seen in the distance, there is an ocean and waterways on this planet, which is why the vegetation is so green. There is also edible fruits, nuts, and vegetables we can gather, so we have a plentiful food supply. There is limited information about the animal species of this planet, but I'm sure we will learn about them in due course. We are to ensure that the new city we build will be in a vast area of land, but in close proximity to a water and food supply. Many of you takers have been handpicked, not only for your ability to colonize this planet, but more importantly, you have planning and labor skills, which will be invaluable to our building project. The droids have also been programmed to help build our new empire. We have the next 10 years to create and populate this colony with a new generation of children. We have to build enough dwellings to also accommodate the human contingent on the next ship that arrives on Judaism. If we all work together, we will achieve our goal. Lastly, I have been told by the world controllers to let you know that you will all be rewarded for your efforts once the next ship arrives. One last message. Apart from the use of the latrines, there will be no night walking or taking outside of this camp. The droids will be patrolling the perimeter, and they have been programmed to terminate anyone breaking this rule. I do not wish to see this happen, so please, ensure you stay within the campsite. That is all. Thank you for your attention. There was a murmur from the group when Dr. Greenwich had finished speaking. They seemed resigned to the fact that that there was no form of escaping the life that had been decided for them by the world controllers. So they had better make the best of what had been offered to them. As darkness fell, every couple went to their respective pod tents. Teal had thought that the pods would be small inside, but in fact they were quite roomy. Neon sat down upon the double divider and proceeded to check his data watch. Teal felt a little hesitant as she took up a position on the other side of the divider. Although she was educated as to what was required of her in a mating ritual, because of her age, Teal had never had a partner. She slowly started to unzip her flight suit. I don't think it is a very good idea for you to take your suit off to sleep. I've read it can get very cold here at night. Teal looked over at him with a confused expression on her face. But I thought... Not yet. You still have another week before you are ready to conceive. It is something I had to make note of when I scanned you, and I do not think like a taker. Teal felt stupid as she quickly zipped her flight suit back up and climbed into her portion of the divider without saying anything more. You do realize there is another option for you to conceive. Sorry? Before you are ready to ovulate, I can artificially inseminate you. And you think that will make me feel any better about the whole miserable situation, do you? That procedure is just as invasive for me to deal with. I wouldn't become pregnant at all if I thought that I still had a chance to live. Teal, do you think this is easy for me to get my head around? As I said to you, I'm not a taker. But if I don't do my part in your conception, I'm offering you a death sentence. For a man of my profession, that is not a most desirable position to be in. I'm just trying to give you another quick and easy option that you might feel more comfortable with. I'm sorry about the thought of it. It seems to have infuriated you so much. I'm going to sleep on the ground. Teal took a space cover from the divider to make herself a bed on the floor of the tent. It's going to be uncomfortable for you sleeping on the hard earth. But do as you wish. Good night. Teal felt miserable as she tried to make herself comfortable. She was already fighting with her partner on their first night on Judison. What was the next ten years going to bring? She quietly cried herself to sleep while dreading the thought of it. It was in the early hours of the morning when Teal was suddenly woken by a sharp pain on her leg and she could feel something crawling across her foot. She cried out in fear. It didn't take Neon long to activate the night switch and he came over to see what was the matter. They both watched on 
as a large red insect with numerous legs scuttled away from Teal's foot across the floor and disappeared through a crack in the pod's door. Ah! It bit me! Keep calm. I'll bring up the insect's information on my data watch so we know what we are dealing with. It's okay. The information on here states it is a blood-sucking bug and is not poisonous. So that makes it all right for it to attack me, then? Teal rolled up the leg of her flight suit to survey the damage the bug had caused. Neon said nothing to her rude comment while he took a treatment laser from his medikit and ran it over the wound site. Nah, no harm is done. Shouldn't feel any more pain. I'll get back onto the safety of the divider and stop acting like a child. Teal opened her mouth as if she was going to reply to him, but instead she just sighed deeply. She did as he had told her, though, and once back onto a comfortable bed, she soon fell back to sleep. The warmth of the sun shone brightly upon the pod as Neon gently shook Teal awake. Up you get, sleepyhead. We have a full day ahead of us. The only way I can protect you at the moment is for you to ride with me. So, you're going to have to tag along with the scout group when we head out this morning. For once, Teal decided that Neon's suggestion was a credible one. She was excited about the prospect of seeing more of the area they had been dropped at, and she wasted no time at the dryer cube so that she was ready to depart with the others who had been selected for the scout group. Even though there was no way of their escaping the planet, a droid accompanied them as they started up the sky bikes. Teal had never had the opportunity to ride on a sky bike before, but it was something she had always wanted to try. Neon instructed her to take up the pillion seat behind him and put her arms around his waist. At first she felt a little awkward being so close to him, although she soon lost any concern as they rapidly departed from the base camp headed north. The sun shone down on them between the intermittent cloud cover as they traveled along at a reasonable speed while taking in their surroundings. The valley in which they had been dropped by the spaceship was quite large, but in the opinion of the group, it was not quite large enough to build an entire city. They followed the line of the seashore. However, they never landed on it, much to Teal's disappointment. She would have loved the opportunity to dip her feet into the cool, clear water as it lapped upon the sandy shore. She guessed there would be time enough to do just that, given the years they were to inhabit the planet. When they came across a river mouth, Neon signaled them to make their way inland. The group followed its winding pathway up into a large sheltered valley. What they saw next surprised all of them, for grazing on the grassland was a herd of huge, odd-looking grayish-brown creatures. Neon put his hand up, so that everyone stopped and placed their bikes into hover mode. He flicked on his data watch and then shook his head in disbelief. These creatures are dinosaurs. The breed below us are called Diplodocus, to be precise. They once roamed Earth, it appears, millions of years ago. Apart from their massive size, this breed of dinosaur are herbivores, so we are in no immediate danger. How come they are here if they were on Earth? That doesn't make sense. That is a million water leader question. I can only surmise that when the universe was created, given that this planet has as much the same environment that Earth had, they evolved in the same way. Hopefully they are the only breed of dinosaur here, because going by the data on my watch, Diplodocus had predators, who were a fearsome lot. Teal shuddered to think how big the predators would be, to take down the likes of these huge creatures. Neon must have felt her tensing up, and he chuckled quietly. At least they can't fly, Teal. What do the rest of you think about this valley being a good site to start building? What about the creatures living in it? Well, I think they will come in most useful for our building project, given their size. I used to work for a farm dome, and we had oxen trained to do as we wished. If the information is correct that these creatures are herding animals, we may be able to train them. 
we could at least herd them into a laser corral and uh, attempt to domesticate them. That is an interesting concept. If you think it is possible, Nala, I will leave you in charge of that project. Right. Now we have decided where to start building once the dinosaurs are contained. We will move our base camp to this location. Okay, let's make our way back to the others and let them know what we have found. The following week was a very productive one for the colony. It appeared that Noah was correct in his assumption about the Diplodocus. Even though they were huge in comparison to the humans, they were not very clever and when given food rewards, they were soon doing simple tasks for their trainers. The new campsite had a commanding view of the valley, and everyone seemed to be settling into their new surroundings. Even Teal and Neon had warmed a little more towards each other, and when the time came for her to conceive, they spent their time together with mutual understanding of what needed to be achieved. As time went by, the bare valley in which the colony had settled was transformed into a huge building project. It appeared by all accounts that the takers had been picked for their trade skills, more so than for their other desires. Glass, steel, and other metals were produced using the resources the planet had to offer them. With the strength of the dinosaurs and the droids, the surrounding area soon took shape as the house developments were formed on the once grassy landscape. When the permanent pods were ready, the humans felt a sense of achievement as they took up position in their own homes. Even better that they didn't have to pay for the plentiful supply of fresh natural water. Then, as expected, nine months after they had landed at Judison, babies started to be born. Neon was kept very busy ensuring the good health of mother and child. He enlisted Teal to assist him, and even though she was close to the birth of her own baby, she enjoyed the feeling of seeing new life created. Then, one warm evening in late summer, Teal gave birth to her own son, and as much as she didn't want to admit the fact, given that she had no choice about becoming a mother, she really enjoyed her new vocation. For some reason, as the colony grew and worked together, they all became a close-knit community. Never once did the droids have to take charge of a situation they had dealt with when the prisoners first arrived on Judison. It seemed that everything was running to plan. The city was being built, and the colony was growing. A year before the arrival of the next ship, Neon and Teal alone had produced six children, four boys and two girls. The planet now had a larger population of children than adults. Everything seemed to be panning out nicely for the world controllers with the successful colonization of Judison. And soon, people from Earth would be joining them when the next ship was scheduled to arrive. Sadly, this happy future for the colony was soon to change when an event occurred one day which no one had foreseen. Neon and a couple of the other men were on a reconnaissance mission to source a new area for further development. Rather than using the sky bikes, they decided to ride on several of the Diplodocus out from the perimeter they had already surveyed. As always, they were accompanied by a droid guard. The mission started off well, and although the dinosaurs moved slowly because of their huge size, the scout group managed to cover a fair distance on the first day. They camped down for the night, not thinking that there would be a problem with their mounts safely placed into a laser corral. Yet, in the middle of the night, Neon was woken by one of the beasts bellowing at the top of its voice. He raced outside to see that the droid had somehow managed to become imprisoned inside the corral. The laser field must have caused him to malfunction, and he had spooked the dinosaurs. Neon rushed over to deactivate the laser field, but before he could reach it, one of the beasts stood on the droid and crushed him under its massive foot. The other men came running from their pods, and between them they managed to calm the creatures down with food offerings. While the dinosaurs were busy eating, 
Neon turned off the laser field and pulled the remains of the droid away from the creatures. Mezzo came in. You can go back to your pods now. Thank you for assisting me to calm the dinosaurs. It was then, in the light of the two moons, that he noticed a tiny, bright red glowing microchip. He picked it up and turned it over in his fingers a couple of times before taking it back to his pod. Once inside, Neon hesitated for a second, and then, flicking open his data watch, he placed the chip into the microprocessor. What happened next was beyond belief. There was highly confidential information on the chip, which had been programmed into the droid by the world controllers. It appeared that an hour before the new spaceship was to arrive on the planet, the droids had been programmed to terminate everyone on Judison who was over the age of ten. The whole project was a farce. The only reason the prisoners had been sent there was to create a city for the world controllers and their faithful to inhabit. Neon could only surmise the reason for their children was to repopulate the new planet because most of the world controllers were not young in years and would need to be looked after in their old age. The young doctor felt physically and psychologically sickened at the thought that the controllers could stoop so low. However, he knew one thing. The colony were not going to go down without a fight. Neon went back outside and dragged the remains of the droid into his pod. He then set about dismantling it, so that he soon had its parts spread out on the ground in front of him. He wanted to be able to understand the makings of the droid, in the hope that he could find a weakness in their makeup. The colony needed to be able to somehow overthrow the machines before the ship arrived. Neon took out all the memory cards and microchips he could find from the droid. He then ran them one by one through his data watch. Just when it seemed that the world controllers had covered all their bases, Neon suddenly let out a happy cry. It appeared that, in their haste to create the killer droids, the controllers had missed one crucial piece of data. The droids were unable to detect when any of their kind had been deactivated or lost without physically sighting the damaged droid. So when the scout group returned without their droid or any part of it, the other droids would be totally oblivious to the fact. So, the only way that the humans would be able to disarm the droids would be to pick them off one by one. Morning broke, and Neon gathered the other men together over breakfast to tell them what he had discovered. We also now have the droid's weapons, so before we return to the city, we will find a safe place to hide this weaponry. Then, when we head out on another mission, we can use it against the droid to take with us. If we mobilize the droids without damaging their weapons, we will be able to gather enough arms to help protect ourselves when the ship arrives. The other men seemed really pleased with Neon's suggestion, because they too were in total disbelief of such an evil plan. They were willing to assist Neon in any way that they could to foil the future massacre. We need to ensure that everyone in the colony are aware of what is going to happen. I don't want the droids to overhear anyone saying that there are droids missing. Such data may be monitored by the world controllers, and we need to have the element of surprise on our side should we go to battle when the ship arrives. How are we going to take on the spaceship with its own laser guns and countless more droids? We still have a year to plan our strategies. In that time, we need to ensure that there is not a droid left standing on Judaism. If we can accomplish this task sooner rather than later, we will have a longer period of time to plan our attack on the ship. When the scouting party arrived back at the city two days later, they wasted no time in passing around the information to the rest of the colony. Even the children were informed of the game they were playing against the nasty droids, minus the additional information, of course. Slowly, over the coming months, the droids were depleted until not one was left operating. There was a taker who had worked with data systems on Earth, 
so he was given the job of monitoring for any information that was sent to the droids from the controllers. Most importantly, he was to reply in such a way as to not give them any clue that the droids had been disassembled. So, with all the colony members' bases covered, they arranged a large meeting to discuss how they were going to intercept and destroy the spaceship when it was ready to land. Noah suggested that they could utilize the Diplodocus in their attack. However, it was Teal, of all people, who came up with a suggestion that no one else would have thought of. Because of her love for history, she remembered reading once about large metal balls which were shot from a heavy metal gun on wheels called a cannon. They were used for sinking ships which sailed on the ocean. What if we could make something like that and fire them at the spaceship? Neon opened his data watch and looked up the information Teal was relaying to them. He read out to the group about how cannons were produced, and also how to make gunpowder, which was the substance used to fire the metal balls from the gun. This idea might just work. Back on Earth, I used to build spacecraft not much smaller than the Reborn. There are a few weak spots within the design of those ships. Just such a weapon, if aimed correctly, for instance, directly into the jet engines, could cause a chain reaction and blow the ship to pieces. There was an excited murmur amongst the group when they realized the task ahead might not be as daunting as they had first envisaged. The following day, the members of the colony wasted no time in sourcing the materials they needed to make weapons they required. It was decided, along with the cannons they produced, there would also be a contingent of men riding the dinosaurs, armed with the laser weapons they had procured from the droids. Together they would make a formidable army. However, they still would have to wait until the ship had just landed before planning their surprise attack. That way there would be little chance of the ship returning fire. They also started to build a large dwelling some distance from the city, so that the children could be safely hidden away should their plan not work as they had wished it to. If the crew on board the ship reached the city, the colony wanted to ensure the safety of their children. With so much work to do, time soon slipped by, and on the day before the pending arrival of the spaceship, the colony had only just managed to finish the camouflage shelters for the cannons and dinosaurs. The heavy iron gunnery had been placed in such a way that no matter which direction the ship landed in the valley, every angle had been accounted for. That way there would be a clear target for a cannonball to be fired straight into the ship's jet engines. No one slept very well that night. All were lost in their own thoughts of the looming battle they would be facing the following day. Early the next morning, all the children were taken to the shelter. Neon instructed Teal to stay with them. However, she would not hear of it. This is my battle too, Neon. There are enough other mothers at the shelter to care for our children. I shan't miss the opportunity to stand alongside you and fight for everything we have created on this planet. Neon knew better than to argue with his partner. Teal had been so much a part of his life for the past ten years, and he was proud that she was such a courageous and strong individual. Come with me, then. He took her to the weapons supply area. There he gave her a laser gun and some armor to put on which each of the fighters were wearing. It would hold little protection from laser fire, but it was better than no protection at all. An hour and a half before the ship was to arrive, the taker who was in charge of droid communications informed Neon that the ship had sent him a message. The world controllers were ensuring the droids were ready to carry out the extermination of the colony adults. Neon had him send a confirmation signal back. It seemed everything was running to schedule. The controllers had no idea that their plans had been foiled. Everyone took up their positions around the valley, with their eyes scanning the blue skies above. Then, and not a moment sooner, one and a half hours after the message had been sent, Reborn, the same ship that had carried them to the planet ten years earlier, entered Judison's atmosphere. 
It hovered for a moment high above their heads, and then slowly it descended until it was touching the ground. Now. Neon yelled loudly over the sound of the jet engines shutting down, and there was a roar of cannon fire as every one of the cannonballs flew through the air and hit the ship from every direction. Teal was helping Neon man the cannon which faced the huge engines. She felt her heart enter her throat as she watched the hard bronze ball fly from the end of the cannon and hit its intended target with deadly accuracy. Then, as planned, the ship started to explode one area after the next. The escape doors at the front of the craft flew open and people and droids could be seen running from the ship. The men who were mounted upon the dinosaurs raced out of their camouflaged shelters and started firing their laser guns at the fleeing ship's occupants. The element of surprise had worked, however, the oncoming survivors of the ship were not going to give up easily as they started to return fire. Between the choking smoke of the exploding ship and the laser fire, chaos took over the valley. The Diplodocus made an easy target for the laser guns to hit and soon they were lying dead. The riders that were not crushed under their fallen beasts carried on firing at the oncoming attackers. Neon signaled Teal to put another bronze ball in the cannon as he pulled the base around so that the cannon was repositioned to face the onslaught. Again, a ball whizzed through the air and landed onto the group, killing several members and a droid. As soon as the others saw what Neon was doing, they followed suit turning their cannons on their enemies, until there was no one left standing. The colony members slowly advanced forward to check that they had killed all of the crew that had escaped from the burning ship. They couldn't believe they had managed to achieve their goal without too many losses of their own people. Neon bent down and ran his scanner over each person as they moved towards the burning ship. It seemed the colony had indeed accomplished their goal, because all the humans he had scanned so far were dead. He pulled one man over onto his back when the scanner picked up a heartbeat. Teal held her laser gun in position ready to fire should the man cause a problem. She gasped when she recognized his face. The man looked up at Neon weakly. You are meant to be a man of intelligence. Therefore, I have no need to answer your question. Neon turned to look at Teal with narrowed eyes and a cold expression on his face. He is all yours, girl. Teal looked down at the evaluator's pleading eyes with her finger poised on the trigger. This is for Jade 7386, you bastard. I'm sure she will welcome you into the afterlife. She applied pressure to the trigger and watched on with an expressionless face as the life left the eyes of her oppressor. Once it was established that everyone from the ship had been eliminated, the colony members took their dead and left the valley. Everyone walked in silence, lost in their own thoughts, but all of them were greatly relieved that they were now able to explore and embrace their new planet as free people.